Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about type 2 diabetes and the gut microbiome, specifically how the metabolic changes that occur as people develop and are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes impact the gut microbiome. My guests today are Dr. Orville Coulterman and Kristen Newsell from Pendulum Therapeutics. Dr. Coulterman is an endocrinologist, and after a long career delivering diabetes care and working on glucose-lowering medications that impact gut hormones, he now serves as Chief Medical Officer at Pendulum Therapeutics. Orville received his undergraduate degree from the University of Kansas, followed by his MD degree and training as an endocrinologist at Stanford University. He served on the faculty at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the University of California School of Medicine, San Diego. Kristen Newsell is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist, and she is Pendulum Therapeutics lead dietitian. She has a master's of science degree and a bachelor of science degree in human nutrition and dietetics from Southern Illinois University Carbondale, where she also minored in Spanish. And I went to SIU Carbondale for undergrad too, not at the same time. So welcome to the show, Dr. Coulterman and Kristen. Thank Thank you for having us. Thanks for the invite and having us. And please call me Orville. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited to talk with you both. Um, I do want our listeners to know that this episode is sponsored by Pendulum Therapeutics, the manufacturer of the medical probiotic Pendulum Glucose Control for people with type 2 diabetes. And we thank Pendulum Therapeutics for their sponsorship and support of the podcast. And we are submitting this episode to the Commission on Dietetic Registration for approval for one free continuing education unit for dietitians, diet technicians, and certified diabetes care and education specialists. So if you're interested in that, please check back to see if and when it's up on my continuing education library at soundbitesrd.com. Now, Orville and Kristen, before we jump into the topic of type 2 diabetes and the gut microbiome, I would really like to know more about both of your backgrounds and the work that you do, as well as any disclosures you might have. And also, I'd like to learn a little bit more about pendulum therapeutics. As you've heard, uh, you know, I'm an endocrinologist who worked in diabetes uh, for my you know, entire professional career, dealing with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I spent 20 years at Amelin Pharmaceuticals, leading various teams that developed four different novel treatments for patients with diabetes and a rare metabolic disorder called lipodystrophy. You know, that company was purchased in 2012, and I flunked retirement and Mm -hmm. was contacted by Pendulum about potentially joining their interesting project. Mm -hmm. And here I am after seven years uh, really enjoying this and being very stimulated by what we do. So Pendulum was founded by three co-founders who met each other working for a company called Pacific Biosciences. Pacific Biosciences is a company that developed one of the machines that does high throughput uh, you know, DNA sequencing. While working there, they decided that they would like to start their own company and hopefully be able to apply the DNA sequencing technology to identify ways to leverage the microbiome to you know, assist patients with chronic disease and you know, really make a difference. To that end, they were doing a contracting project for an academic center related to inflammatory bowel disease. And they noted that within the cohort of patients, there was a subset of patients that had different but unique recurring abnormalities in their microbiome data from the gut microbiome. So they chose to dig into that group of patients a bit more, and they discovered that they had a unique distinguishing aspect in that they were the patients within the entire cohort of patients with inflammatory bowel disease that also had type 2 diabetes. Mm. So they then pursued those abnormalities, and that coupled with 
uh, data that were evolving in the medical literature came to understand that there appeared to be certain functions that were missing from the gut microbiome in patients with type 2 diabetes. Therefore, they set out to identify strains of microbacteria that would restore those functions and you know succeeded in doing that and the bacteria that provide these functions are all anaerobic bacteria which mean that they need to be grown in the complete total absence of oxygen mm -hmm. and that's not manufacturing technique that was uh, available back in 2013 and so mm. the company has developed those manufacturing techniques and have created a five strain formulation designed to help patients with type 2 diabetes which we uh, completed and published a clinical study you know demonstrating that we do bring some benefit excellent yes and we are going to talk about that study and everything our listeners need to know about the gut microbiome and type 2 diabetes. But thank you for laying the groundwork on that and getting us started with that. Kristen, would you like to share a little bit more about your background and the work you do? I know you counsel patients and you create educational materials and you write blog posts. You do a lot of different things I'd love to hear about. Yeah, absolutely. So I started out as a clinical dietitian, like most of us dietitians do. We start in that clinical setting and really get the groundwork for providing medical nutrition therapy on a variety of different disease states. Um, I worked in med surge, cardiac rehab. Of course, diabetes was um, unfortunately pretty frequently discussed with my patients when working in the clinical setting. And from there, I went on to work in industry. I worked for Agerian Pharmaceuticals. So I worked with patients who had rare and ultra rare genetic diseases. So the two genetic diseases I focused on were homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, say that five times fast, <laughs> <Yeah>. and, <laughs> and then generalized lipodystrophy. So basically my focus was, and my emphasis was on diabetes and lipid management. And that's really where my passions lie. And when I heard about pendulum, obviously, I truly believe that the microbiome is the future for medicine. And so I thought this was a wonderful way for me to constantly be thinking and growing. Um, it's like Orville said, it's very stimulating. And at pendulum, I have been here for over a year and really enjoying the work that I do. And I've created this nutrition program here at pendulum where along with pendulum glucose control, and this is very ground groundbreaking, I think, that we provide nutrition consultations to go along with the probiotic purchase. So they can have basically their own personalized dietitian and working on creating some group sessions. I do write blog posts. I help with a CGM study. So we wear a lot of hats and really have been enjoying getting the ability to do all of these wonderful things at Pendulum. How exciting. Thank you. Yes, I was just thinking at the top of the show, you know, diabetes is one of my favorite topics and the gut microbiome is quickly becoming one of my favorite topics because there's so much exciting work and research being done in this area and we're learning so much. But this whole concept of how the microbiome impacts diabetes is pretty new to me. So I'm really interested in learning more from both of you today and this research study and this probiotic supplement. So maybe Orville... Let's start with the gut microbiome. You know, we don't want to spend the whole show on just the gut microbiome. We want to get into the diabetes aspect of it. But what do our listeners need to know about the gut microbiome to start with, but then in particular, the microbiome of people with type 2 diabetes or who are in the process of developing type 2 diabetes? What's going on there? So perhaps I should start with defining what the gut microbiome is. Mm -hmm. This refers to all of the bacteria that reside within the intestinal tract you know, in human beings. And it's really, really fascinating and intriguing with the advent of high throughput DNA sequencing coupled with big data analytical techniques. Investigators came to understand that there's an awful lot of genetic material in our gut. Mm -hmm. It turns out that this microbiome contains over a hundred times as many genes as exist in the human genome. Mm. So the potential for interactions both within the gut microbiome as well as the interaction of the microbiome with our own human genes 
is just mind boggling. Mm. And those of us in the field are confident that as we gain better and better understanding of this, we're going to be able to help, you know, solve problems related to multiple different diseases. Mm. You know, in terms of diabetes, let's look at it from the standpoint that diabetes is one of the circles in a Venn diagram that is the metabolic syndrome, you know, pre-diabetes, lipid disorders, you know, hypertension. So there are abnormalities in the gut microbiome in almost anyone who has the metabolic syndrome. Mm. And there are similarities between those abnormalities and what's seen in patients with type 2 diabetes. At least one way of looking at it, it appears that those abnormalities can progress somewhat and uh, become a bit more severe in individuals who develop prediabetes and then become even more severe in patients who develop full-blown type 2 diabetes. So what are these abnormalities? Well, these abnormalities, which are referred to as a dysbiosis, are characterized by certain bacteria and bacterial functions that are present in the gut microbiome in healthy subjects who do not have type 2 diabetes have gone missing either completely or they are present in significantly decreased quantities, mm. which means that whatever the functions are that those bacteria are providing within the gut have also gone missing. Mm. We now understand that the bacteria within the microbiome in general, but particularly these specific bacteria that I'm talking to that have gone missing in type 2 diabetes, they digest dietary fiber. Prior to understanding this function of the microbiome, I think most of us viewed dietary fiber as a, sort of a bulking agent and it was something that was needed for gut health, but we didn't really know why. Mm. Well, we now understand that the function is just to you know, metabolize this fiber and it metabolizes a fiber to produce molecules that are referred to as short chain fatty acids. And of those three short chain fatty acids, uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, butyrate has come to be understood to be extremely important to health. The reason for that is, is that butyrate provides most of the energy for the cells in the intestinal lining. Butyrate also is a molecule that connects the gut microbiome to the immune system and has some very important effects on the immune system to regulate it, but also by binding to receptors on some special cells that are in the gut lining called the L cells, butyrate stimulates the secretion of an important hormone called GLP-1. Mm. GLP-1 is secreted by these L cells, enters the circulation, it then impacts the beta cells in the pancreas, which many listeners will know are the cells that produce insulin. Mm -hmm. And by interacting with the beta cells, they enhance insulin secretion by the beta cells. So the consequences of losing these butyrate-producing organisms, all those functions become you know, impaired somewhat in patients with type 2 diabetes. Also, in the last few years, investigators have demonstrated and confirmed that there's a leaky gut component to type 2 diabetes where the barrier at the gut interface with the intestinal contents becomes leaky and it allows things that shouldn't come across into the circulation to come across. And those toxins, if you will, drive a systemic you know, inflammatory process that appears to be playing a key role in interfering with the way insulin works you know, in patients with type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a lot of science, but I'm following. So one of the questions that comes to mind, I mean, you talk about this dysbiosis, um, fiber digestion produces these short chain fatty acids and butyrate in particular is really important to health and immunity. You also mentioned chronic inflammation, which I want to touch on. Do we know, are these changes in the microbiome leading to causing diabetes, or is the diabetes contributing to this, or do they just kind of go hand in hand? That's an excellent question. Do not yet have definitive data in humans, but work that has been done in uh, two or three different road models 
you know, of diabetes demonstrate clearly that the derangements in the gut microbiome that's seen in patients with type 2 diabetes can induce, you know, the diabetic state in and of themselves. Wow. Okay. And I know that when we talk about the specific research study, we're going to talk more about what that might mean for future research and for clinical application. But one more little question regarding the microbiome. Obviously, we know that a healthy gut leads to a healthy person. You know, we can't be healthy if our gut is not healthy. We have got to put good things in to have good things come out. And maybe that's not the right way to say that. But how important is the role of our food choices and eating patterns versus maybe like genetics? Excellent question. And let me preface this by saying that the gut microbiome is a massive organ, you know, that we've just discovered. And so there's still a lot of things that are unknown, and it's just going to be a very exciting area over the coming decade. What we do know is that multiple things can influence the gut microbiome. The food, nutrition, types of food that you know we eat, there's been a lot of correlation done with changes in the gut microbiome and evolution of the so-called Western diet which uh, an increase in simple sugars, decreased consumption of complex carbohydrates, you know, decreased fiber intake, all have an impact on the microbiome, as does the type of exercise that we engage in. You know, there, there are not strong genetic components drawn between that and changes in the gut microbiome. But, you know, there is an interesting link that may tie us together with our ancestors and namely is that the gut of the developing fetus is sterile it has no bacteria mm -hmm. and the gut of the infant begins to be populated as the infant passes through the birth canal mm -hmm. and then also picks up bacteria from the mother's uh, you know skin particularly during breastfeeding mm -hmm. and we now know that contrary to what i was taught in medical school but there are actually bacteria that are transferred from the mother to the infant in breast milk. Mm -hmm. And so there's a probably a fairly tight leak there provided by those processes uh, between infants and their mothers and therefore their ancestors. Actually, I, I know a little bit about that because I had a podcast episode focused on probiotics in infants. I'll link to that in the show notes if anybody's interested in a real scientific deep dive on that. So that makes me wonder this loss of diversity or this decrease in diversity in the gut is not healthy for many reasons. But when it comes to diabetes, it sounds like it may be contributing to the development and or progression of type 2 diabetes. But also, it seems like with this research study and with the probiotic, the pendulum glucose control is what it's called, that the gut microbiome actually can directly impact blood glucose control. But it sounds like in normal diabetes management, you know, you mentioned we've got lifestyle, we have food and nutrition, we have exercise, stress management, there's glucose lowering medications, um, there's monitoring blood glucose, blood pressure, cholesterol, eye health, all of these things. And that's a really strong foundation. And we have to cover a lot of bases with that. But it sounds like looking at the microbiome is one more thing that we can look at that can make a difference. I think a good way to think about everything that I've been talking about is that up to the present time, the recommended dietary management that all dietitians teach patients with type 2 diabetes may just be half of the equation in terms of dietary management of type 2 diabetes. And what I mean by that is that that counseling always emphasizes the you know, increase in fiber you know, in the diet, uh, complex carbohydrates, replacing simple sugars etc. Mm -hmm. But increasing the fiber content in the diet is not going to have the full desired effect if the bacteria that are needed to digest that fiber and turn them into these short-chain fatty acids, the specific short-chain fatty acids that I've talked about, you know, are not present. So mm -hmm. in many ways, the use of our product, the way I think about it is providing the second half of the diet equation. Very interesting because there's that similarity there, like you were talking about with the infants. If they don't have enough of a certain bacteria in their guts, they can't 
I don't want to say this wrong, but uh, that the lack thereof is sort of like a, a traffic jam. Things can't move forward. Things can't progress. That's really you know important because we now understand that the interaction between the infant's immune system and what's in their gut, their gut microbiome during the first few years of life that programs their immune system for the remainder of their life. And we're starting to come to understand that things going astray or not being quite right during that period of time are tightly linked to the evolution of autoimmune diseases Mm. later in life. As I'm thinking as you're talking, moving forward and progressing is not the best way to say it because what I'm not saying is the progression of diabetes. What I'm saying is like you have to have those building blocks there in order for the immune system and the healthy things. One of the best nutrients for these uh, healthy bacteria is actually the complex carbohydrate that is in breast milk. Mm. There's a very tight correlation there. And we've known for years that being bottle fed as opposed to being breastfed is something that increases your risk for type 2 diabetes a bit. So with regard to fiber, and this is maybe where Kristen can jump in a little bit, when people have diabetes, there tends to be this fear of carbohydrates, but that's where a lot of the fiber in our food is found. And we know that fiber is good for our digestion, and we know it's good for the microbiome, and we've just been talking about um, specifically producing those short-chain fatty acids and butyrate. So can you talk to us a little bit more about fiber and with your work in counseling people with diabetes, what kind of conversations do you have with them about carbs, fiber, gut health, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So as most dietitians know, whenever you talk to someone who has type 2 diabetes, they are terrified of carbohydrates. I mean, that's just bad. Uh, They avoid them, even if it's fruit. Um, And sometimes they don't even know exactly what a carbohydrate is, but generally Mm -hmm. it's fear. So they're afraid to have these because they don't want their sugars going up. Mm -hmm. And what I talk to them about is incorporating more fiber. And I educate them that fiber is a type of carbohydrate that doesn't impact your blood sugars. So I educate them on finding net carbs. I'll just give you an example. Yesterday, um, I spoke to a client and she's like, well, I don't want to have beans. You know, I do keto. I don't want to have that many carbs. I mentioned her about beans and being a great source of fiber to easily get that into her diet and seeing how she felt about it. And her first reaction was, no way, like that's too many carbs. I look at the label and the beans have way too many carbs. And so I taught her the little trick about net carbs, which she didn't know about. And I also educate them on if you are doing a complete ketogenic diet, right, where it's extremely low, maybe 25, 30 grams of carbs a day, you're depriving your gut microbiome. So if they're taking pendulum glucose control, where they're replenishing their gut microbiome with bacterial strains they may not have had, but you're not feeding them, that butyrate can't get produced. And so the whole thing most likely won't be as efficacious or at work as well as if you're feeding them. And one thing to keep in mind is that the bacterial strain are living organisms. They like to eat too. And if not, they get a little hangry and they die off. So Mm. just like you and I, we get hangry. And so they're all fighting over the little bit of fiber that they're given. Mm -hmm. So I really work with clients to get them to feel comfortable with picking the right carbohydrates and explaining to them there's a difference. When you say 15 grams of carbohydrates, I'm not talking about 15 grams of Sour Patch Kids. I'm talking about 15 grams of lentils and fresh fruits and vegetables and trying to get that and incorporate it into their diet. So that way they're not only helping with digestion and helping satiety, but they're also helping feed the gut microbiome and slow the absorption of sugar. So I really try and focus on that and to get a little bit into the nitty gritty, mainly focusing on soluble fibers because Mm -hmm. that's what's going to feed the gut microbiome. When you look at fibers, of course, we all know insoluble versus soluble They all have different roles and insoluble while very helpful for other things like colon health. It's not going to feed the gut microbiome. It's kind of just like roughage. Mm. So it will just pass through. But what we really need to focus on is the soluble fiber. And so I do educate clients on trying to get more soluble fiber. So things like your beans and your fruits and vegetables, they typically have both insoluble and soluble fiber. 
Mm -hmm. Oatmeal, right? Of course. Oatmeal is a wonderful source. (laughs) Excellent. I do want to say, because we are speaking about gut health, but you know, with regards to diabetes and type 2 diabetes specifically, that if people are interested, I did do a recent podcast episode on digestive health, probiotics, prebiotics, and fermentation. And that was episode 162. So they can go listen to that if they want more on the digestive health aspect. I'll put the link in my show notes as well. So back to the pendulum glucose control and the fiber. So it sounds like what you're saying is this medical probiotic helps your body make use of all this fiber that you're trying to increase your fiber or you're trying to do the right thing, but this probiotic helps your body use that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. So basically, the medical probiotic is replacing your body with strains uh, that you may not have if you have type 2 diabetes. And so if you're just eating fiber and you don't have these bacterial strains that are found in pendulum glucose control, you won't have that breakdown of the fiber and the butyrate will not be produced to start that whole similar to GLP-1 process that Orbo was mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. So without these specific strains, that process doesn't happen. Orville, I don't know if you want to add to that. The product, uh, you know, was specifically designed to, you know, replace those strains. Uh, When I say strains, it's, it's actually was designed to replace the functions that are associated with, you know, the bacteria that have gone missing in the uh, microbiome of patients with type 2 diabetes. And what I mean by functions, it's like we want a strain in there that is a good butyrate producer Mm. to ensure that there's an adequate supply of butyrate for all the reasons that I uh, alluded to earlier in the conversation here. Okay, great. It's becoming more clear. And I want to talk about the research study, but you had mentioned inflammation before and certainly as we said, if there's not enough butyrate produced, that can be bad for inflammation. But was there anything else you wanted to speak to with regard to how inflammation factors into this whole equation? So two additional comments to make, I guess. Uh, So thank you for the question. First, there are two components to creating, you know, the inflammation. You know, I mentioned butyrate feeding the cells of the intestinal lining and keeping them healthy. If there's not enough butyrate present to keep them totally healthy, they start to separate a bit. So there are these tight junctions that hold adjacent cells together. If the cells are not well nourished, those tight junctions start to loosen and they allow things to cross over that shouldn't cross over. Mm. But the second component to this is that in the intestinal tract, there is a layer of mucus that lies on top of this gut lining epithelium. And that mucus layer serves as a uh, filter that traps a lot of things that are inside of the lumen of the gut that shouldn't come across. So for example, there are you know some bacteria that aren't involved in what we've been talking about that tend to die off while they are passing through the gut. And when they die off, their coatings start to disintegrate and they give off a product called lipopolysaccharide, which is usually trapped by the mucus layer. But if the mucus layer is not healthy and it's not as thick as it should be, these lipopolysaccharide particles get through and they turn out to be extraordinarily inflammatory. Once they enter the circulation, they're inflammatory to the lining of the blood vessels. And when they get out into tissues throughout the body, wherever they go, they create uh, some inflammation. So in the last five years or so, we've learned that patients with type 2 diabetes, there's inflammation in their muscles, there's inflammation in their fat tissues, there's a lot of inflammation in the liver, inflammation in the heart, and even inflammation in the brain. Mm. So in pendulum glucose control, you know, we have both butyrate producers and we have a special, you know, or a very unique microbacteria called AMUC and AMUCINOSOPHILIA, which plays a major role in maintaining the health of this mucin layer that overlies the uh, intestinal epithelium. Okay, thank you for explaining that. That's very helpful. Let's talk about the research study. And you know, I really keep coming back to this in my mind, even though, yes, we're talking about how this is 
making the gut healthier, but it really impacts blood sugar levels too. So this is something that people can see immediately. I mean, not, not like it, you take it and it works right away. I don't want to say that, but there are some really tangible results that we're going to get to. So let's talk about the research study. It was published in the British Medical Journal. It was very recent, like July of 2020? July, August. Uh, okay, very recent. And the title is Improvements to Postprandial Glucose Control in Subjects with Type 2 Diabetes, a Multicenter Double Blind Randomized Placebo Controlled Trial of a Novel Probiotic Formulation. So, talk to me a little bit about how this study came about, what you looked at, and what the findings were, and what this really means for people with type 2 diabetes. Sure. The purpose of the study, both Kristen and I have made some reference to designing a formulation of the probiotic that is tailored to address the deficiencies that's developed in the gut microbiome of patients with type 2 diabetes. So the purpose of the study was to evaluate the formulation in patients with type 2 diabetes and determine whether, I guess one way of saying it, whether the assumptions that had been made in terms of selecting the strains, what I mean, actually worked the way that we thought they would to produce a product that would be beneficial. So to do this, recruited patients with type 2 diabetes who were early in the disease process. And when patients are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they almost always are started on a drug called metformin. Mm -hmm. So we recruited patients with type 2 diabetes who were using metformin so that they would be early in the disease process and therefore most likely to be able to alter their disease processes. And they were randomized to placebo or one of two probiotic formulations. The first formulation contained three bacteria, two of which produced butyrate. And then the other formulation had two additional strains added in. So there was a three strain and a five strain formulation. The patients, after being randomized, took the designated study product for a total of 12 weeks, taking it with the morning meal and the evening meal. And after 12 weeks, we showed that if you did a meal tolerance test, that means you, you have the patients eat a standardized meal and you draw blood throughout the three hour period, starting when they start to eat the meal, that the glucose area under the curve was decreased. So area under the curve, if you think about just drawing a, you know, a line, tracing glucose concentrations over a three hour period, and you draw vertical lines at time zero and at time 180, you then integrate the area under that glucose curve that was reduced. And we also were able to show that the reason that the total glucose AUC was decreased was because the portion of the area under the glucose curve that was directly related to the subject eating the meal, the so-called incremental glucose AUC was also decreased. In fact, it's the decrease in the meal related glucose surge that you know accounted for the improvement in glucose control. Hmm. That improvement in glucose control, as reflected by those meal tolerance tests, resulted or translated into a change or reduction in hemoglobin A1C of 0 0.6. Hemoglobin A1C is the standard, the gold standard measure of diabetes control, mm -hmm. and it reflects the average glucose that the patient was exposed to during the preceding three months or the three months prior to the blood sample being drawn. Excellent. And so after the 12 weeks, the A1C reduction, you said was 0.6%. Correct. And just as a comparison, I believe diet therapy, uh, nutrition, healthier eating improvements can reduce somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.5% to 1%. And same with many of the medications. At least that's what the cobwebs in my memory are saying. That's generally true. Sure, we see variations, but... I think what's important to remember about this study is that the probiotic produced that 0.6 reduction 
you know, on top of what metformin had done, on top of what the usual diet changes had done. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out because these are cumulative. They do add up and that is a significant improvement. So with this research and these results, does it provide any insight or guidance on future research? And also, obviously, we can apply this to clinical practice, but I'd love to hear you talk about that. Sure. So the first guidance that it gives to future research studies is is that in the study, we saw evidence that the glucose control in the subjects, you know, on the five-string formulation did not really start to show signs of improvement until about six weeks into the study. So that means that that 0.6 reduction in A1C that we saw is reflective of only six weeks worth of improved glucose control. Mm -hmm. And since that reflects the average glucose over the preceding three months, Mm -hmm. it suggests that if the subjects use the product for a longer period of time, that that reduction in A1C would be even greater. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to look at in future studies. Another is if we provide some fiber supplements to the subjects, you know, going above and beyond just their dietary fiber, well, that sort of supercharges the bacteria more so that they will give us an, an even greater, you know, reduction in A1C. Mm. And then, you know, we need to explore, we know what happens if we put it on top of metformin, but what happens if we use the probiotic in conjunction with other medications? Mm-hmm. And then also, as a clinical investigator, I would really have liked to do the study in patients right at the time that they were diagnosed before they had received any drug therapy, because it's at that point in time that the diabetes is usually most amenable to improvement by any of the treatment modalities that that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. We weren't able to do that because those patients are very difficult to capture right at that moment before they, if I may use the phrase, become contaminated you know, with a drug. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, the earlier you go in the disease, that the more effective the treatment might be. So, so let me be really clear. We don't yet have any data in patients with prediabetes, but there's good reason to believe that these benefits could also be realized, you know, in patients with prediabetes. And we have a small study that's ongoing that will give us some direct insight into that in the next few weeks here. Oh, great. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is, if your goal is to kind of catch them as early as possible, then would prediabetes, just metabolic syndrome, be a good match for that? So I'll be interested in hearing how those results turn out. What about people with type 1 diabetes? Is this indicated for them at all? So, you know, we haven't studied the product in patients with type 1 diabetes. Patients with type 1 diabetes also have a dysbiosis or have abnormalities in their gut microbiome that are similar but yet different to those seen Mm -hmm. in patients with type 2 diabetes. What's interesting about type 1 diabetes is that we know that it's an autoimmune disease. If you think about my earlier comments about programming the immune system during infancy, we now know from studies done in high-risk individuals that infants who are at high risk for developing type 1 diabetes because of their family history, have a very distinctive signature in their gut microbiome by the age of six months. Mm. So there is a lot of potential for microbiome manipulations, you know, in patients with type 1 diabetes or in the area of type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Our product may have benefit, but we just don't know. It hasn't been tested yet. Okay, interesting. Kristen, I'd love to hear maybe some examples or many case studies about your work with some of your patients who are using pendulum glucose control and also um, where people can find out more information about the product and where they can purchase it, how much it costs, all of those details. And I can also put links in the show notes as well. I believe the website is pendulumlife.com. Yes, that's correct. So if anyone's interested in learning more about it, I would recommend they check out pendulumlife.com. If you want to know the prices, we have three different price tiers. So basically, we have the one-month option, the three-month package, and then subscription. And they range from $165 a month to $198 a month. 
Um, they do include free A1C testings and a money back guarantee. So great. And then in terms of case studies or just scenarios, as I like to refer to them for working with a bunch of customers who have been on pendulum glucose control, I'll give you this example. And this customer stands out to me from the South. So from the Southern region, she didn't have a very good diet in her 60s, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, oh gosh, 20 years ago. And poor thing. I mean, she has just tried everything and she needed a lot of nutrition help. A1C was 10%. Mm. So I helped her out a lot. She has been super vigilant with taking pendulum glucose control, has a lot on her plate um, in addition to having type 2 diabetes, but she has made this such a priority and she's implemented new dietary changes, added fiber. She was definitely one of those people who was terrified of carbohydrates like we see. So it's slow baby steps to get them to accept adding in some fiber here and there and some complex carbohydrates is A-OK in moderation. So her A1C, so in March, it was 10%. And then a few weeks ago, she got it done in October, 6.7. Wow. I mean, she was ecstatic. She, you know, was so, so happy. And she's been working so hard. And I'm just so, so proud of her for everything that she's accomplished. And it's great to hear stories from her and from others. I do get texts from customers mm -hmm. all the time, like Kristen, my A1C went down. So of course they do tell me other benefits that we haven't studied. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't make the claims, but these are just anecdotally from customers like, oh, I've lost weight. I have increased satiety, mm -hmm. different things like that. But again, I want to be very clear. These aren't our claims. We haven't studied them. Just things that we've been hearing from customers. Well, great. I wanted to just say, just just for our listeners. So for most people, the A1C goal is less than 7%. And so can you say, so if, if she was at 10%, roughly what that means her average blood sugar is running? So at 6%, I believe it's 154 on average. Mm -hmm. The value of 10% is going to be in the high 200s or low wow. 300s. Okay. I wanted to put some numbers to that for our listeners. And as you said, I mean, this woman has had diabetes for 20 years. And so that is really encouraging that it's not too late and that you can see such improvements. Yeah, I'm really happy for her. And so to answer your question, 10% is roughly about 240 milligrams per deciliter. So that's on average what her sugars were running. And now at about 6.7, that's roughly 145 milligrams per deciliter. That's a beautiful number. Yeah. Wonderful. Any other stories or examples you want to share? I will share this one. So another gentleman who very busy, very busy, he's an executive, has an extremely busy lifestyle, does not have time to focus on meals. And he was a dieter. So he did keto. He did intermittent fasting. He did anything that was new. And what happens, you know, we as dietitians, we all know what happens with that is they crash and they're always waiting for the next thing new to happen. And he could not manage his blood glucose levels because he was always trying these new things. So I got him to really I'm a firm believer in intuitive eating and, you know, not going for the latest crazy 10 grams of carbohydrates a day diet. And so <laughs> um, I really educated him on, you know, more of an intuitive eating balance and got him to be accepting of incorporating more healthy carbs to feed the gut microbiome and help manage his blood glucose levels. He even bought the book, Intuitive Eating. He was so excited about it. And He's doing great. So his numbers have improved. His A1C, I can't remember the exact numbers, but they have improved by about 0.5%, I believe. I've only been working with him for a short while. But with him, he was open to making changes, but very busy. So we had a few different things that we had to work on. But the majority of these people that I really work on, when I talk about incorporating fiber, they haven't even thought of it. That's like the one trendy mm. diet that they haven't, if you're in air quotes, <laughs> that they haven't thought of. Wow. So as you know, there's tons of fads out there. And so by talking, they're like, oh, I never even thought about that. How do I get that? So mm -hmm. I do talk to them about, and I send them a little gift in the mail, just a little example of some high fiber alternatives. So that way they're getting more 
accepting of adding carbohydrates to their diets. But in a nutshell, that's the majority of my conversations is trying to help them become more accepting of incorporating more fiber to help A, feed the gut microbiome and B, help manage our blood glucose levels. Yeah. It's always nice to talk about adding something. It's probably another reason they didn't think of it because when we think about quote unquote dieting, we always think about what we shouldn't be doing and not what we should be adding. So that's always a nice thing to do. I agree 100%. That's my nutrition philosophy is nutrition's really about adding things to the diet and not subtracting it. So I love that. I'm always talking about getting more nutrients in our food and nutrient rich choices. And, you know, there's room for empty calorie foods, but we can get more nutrients in every bite, whether that's protein or fiber or vitamins. Well, this has been really interesting to learn more about how diabetes management can and should involve the gut and the microbiome. One of the things that I read that I thought was really compelling that I wanted to share is that this pendulum glucose control supplement is the only medical probiotic clinically shown to lower A1C and blood glucose spikes for the dietary management of type 2 diabetes. So it's really exciting to hear about this research and this probiotic. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that you wanted to share before we we wrap up and I share some resources for everybody? I don't think so, Melissa. I'd just like to thank you again for inviting us and the opportunity to speak with you and share our story with your audience. My pleasure. It's been very interesting and I look forward to following the work that you're continuing to do and having this on my radar now. And as I said before, the website for more information is pendulumlife.com. I will have links to all the resources, including the study, which is open access, so people can read that. And I am definitely going to include a link to a webinar on this. Both of you are speaking in this webinar, and it's through the Diabetes Dietetic Practice Group, which I'm on the board for. So I'll be sure to have that link in my show notes, too, so that people can get more information through that. So thank you both again for being on the show and sharing all this great information. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts. 